Uh, good afternoon, my name is Amol Parikh. Uh, I'm here from Doodle Labs to talk to you about our advanced networking technology and how in the hands of first responders, it can increase situational awareness and save lives. So we at Doodle Labs designed a solution called the Wearable Mesh Rider Radio for public safety teams. This device enables rapid de deployment of reliable mesh networks and, the, uh, and the, use, the most effective use of situational awareness apps like TAC in off-grid and challenging environments. So first, I wanna briefly talk to you about the benefits of situational awareness apps for public safety and first responders. With the advent of situational awareness apps, probably a lot of you know this, but the ones like TAC, first responders can now harness data and connect uh, with each other to make response efforts safer and more effective. TAC is designed for team communication and coordination in the field specifically for critical teams. With the app, first responders are able to make use of critical information in real time, like seeing themselves and their teammates position on a map, watch high definition video, like the feed from a drone, um, communicate over voice or text, share useful information like photos in the field. And traditionally, these critical teams have had to rely on sharing information on simple push to talk uh, radios where they have to tell each other where they are, where uh, something is uh, by voice, and it can be hard at night or when the visibility is low. So with that in mind, I want to tell you about, uh, I'll give you some examples of the use of TAC. So we worked closely while developing this with the Corona Fire Department in Southern California. They often respond to, wired, well, they often respond to wildfires, and they're early adopters of TAC and they use it to coordinate their own emergency response efforts uh, in, um, in wildfire scenarios or beyond the, use of, uh, the availability of cell networks. So we worked closely with them to develop this tool um, and to, to make it something that was useful to them in the field. In this field simulation that we have modeled here, they were responding at night to a uh, simulated search and rescue scenario along a riverbank. They had three teams, they had to go to points A, B, and C, um, east to west, or west to east. And um, in the simulation without TAC, without the ability to really coordinate using that tool, they were scattered, they weren't able to uh, get to the right place. A lot of them didn't even make it to the waypoints they were supposed to get to. Then they re-ran it again with TAC. They could see themselves on the map along with other team members and they easily filtered exactly to the waypoints they're supposed to be at. The field simulation showed that responders utilizing TAC were quicker and more efficient in their coordination than those who did not. As you well know, a real life rescue scenario, the speed and effectiveness of response efforts can literally be the difference between life and death. So the promise of situational awareness uh, apps for groups like remote firefighters is big. Respond more quickly and effectively and increase the potential to save more lives. However, without reliable connectivity, in areas where traditional communications networks are weak, damaged, or non-existent, the benefits of those apps are, are, uh, are lost, and the ability to have that increased team coordination is lost as well. So I've been talking about how this benefits the firefighters. Again, we work closely with the Corona Fire Department, so I want to play a little video testimonial from a firefighter at the Corona Fire Department. His name is Andreas Johansson, and he's got a wealth of experience and understanding of the merits and advantages of situational awareness apps in the field. My name is Andreas Johansson. I'm a captain for the Corona Fire Department in Southern California. A, a, a recent uh, deployment we had using TAC uh, on uh, New Year's Eve 2022, we had uh, a large rainstorm come across uh, Southern California. Uh, we responded to a swift water rescue, a report of someone uh, that would possibly fallen in the river. Uh, we had a large area search over about three miles uh, in the dark, driving rain, and being able to track our dismounted personnel, there was a lot less radio traffic of, of trying to determine who had searched where, where they had searched. We were able to see responders in real time. Um, when we did get uh, someone find a, a rescue point, they could just drop it in the map, send it to everybody. We're all in the same sheet of music. We could all uh, kind of pivot and, and move to that location very fast. The role that technology plays in the fire service now, um, it's been kind of stagnant. I see it for the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. 
technology and CAD and GIS has, has really has moved forward, allowing us to know where fire engines are. We can see mapping elements. But when we move away from the fire engine is really where we're, we're left kind of with a gap. Uh, we don't know where our, our, our responders are that are dismounted. We don't have a, a common operating picture um, for us to kind of see where other forces are. So we're left asking a lot of questions over the radio. Where are you? Where is that? Yeah, so the future I see and, and where we're kind of out the Kona Fire Department is, is using uh, the TAC application to answer those questions. Uh, we can see where our other uh, responders are. We can do target correlation, drop a point on the map and all be on kind of the same sheet of music. So the real-time collaboration with TAC and its effectiveness and saving lives really comes down to, to time. Us not wasting time um, trying to determine where someone is. We have the ability to, um, as the military calls it, target correlation. So we'll be able to drop a target on the map. All of us sync up together in real time and figure out the best plan of action before we might waste uh, you know, an hour of time hiking out to some area and realize, oh, it's too steep to get here. It's, you know, and it's hard to tell it in dark, but with TAC, we're able to, to measure distance and terrain and come up with plans, get real-time ETAs of aircraft. So all of it comes down to time. Um, and when someone's life is all on the line, um, you know, time, time can be life, life or death. And having to try to explain to everybody your location, now you can just say, I need help. Everybody sees you in TAC and can pivot to come help. Connectivity is, is an issue though. So uh, that is something that you have to plan for. We use an acronym in the fire service and this came from the military, the PACE plan. So you have a primary plan, alternate plan, contingency and emergency plan. Those typically are, are used to talk about operational um, plans. I, I've brought PACE into the communications and data plan. You know, you, you have to have an alternate means. If you're relying on LTE or cellular for your operation, if you get out of the range, you know, you're, you're dead in the water with TAC. Although you can still use TAC by yourself to navigate, you will not see um, other members. So that's where bringing in, you know, alternative plans, um, alternate communication networks like uh, mesh radios and, and the like come into play. The biggest benefit or the change I see with bringing mesh radio in is the confidence people have in using the situational awareness tools. So if they're thinking, well, this only works on the edge or when I'm in, the, I'm in an area that's close to an urban environment, they think, well, these tools aren't useful outside of that. That brings that confidence up that know that I have continuity of operations. If I move out of cellular network, I know I have an alternate means. I can keep using the tool. The way I see mobile mesh radio is improving safety on a wildfire response is that continu continuity of operations taking you from the LTE uh, out out of, out of that LTE fringe area and then being able to keep sending um, our position location. That's probably the, the number one um, thing that, that really, really helps. When you call for help, people know where you are. Um, so as, as you were saying, this is where we wanted to ground this in the solution that's actually beneficial to the people in the, uh, in the field. And so these powerful applications promise to give first responders a lift, increased response and speed and effectiveness, improved connectivity and continuity of operations, increased confidence in the utilization of situational awareness tools in the field. However, as he said, real life missions require reliable connectivity, especially when staged off grid or when cell networking infrastructure is damaged, like after a disaster event or they're simply congested like in an emergency response situation. The highest performing mesh networks previously have been out of reach for regional, state, and local agencies due to cost. Other networking solutions lack the necessary bandwidth to perform meaningful functions that make the, these apps impactful. So that's why we developed the wearable mesh rider radio. It's a small yet powerful handheld mesh radio. We designed it for high bandwidth, long range mesh connectivity, for critical comms that allow first responders to uh, bring their network with them no matter the environment. Combining our expertise working with the DOD, public, safety, and commercial partners, we designed the radio to provide the highest level of performance at an affordable price point. We want to support the incredible work of first responders and believe that they should have, that, should have access to the best tools available. So we designed a mil-spec radio that extends existing network coverage and is about 10 to 15 times more affordable than competing comms options. Which makes, uh, 
which makes their life-saving tools, uh, tools an option for many more who need them. The wearable Mesh Rider radio is a handheld device that enables public safety teams to uh, uh, maintain a reliable connection between team members, vehicles, and equipment, regardless of whether they're on or off the grid. The device creates a completely disconnected man -A, which is mobile ad hoc network, and has an LTE and network extension feature that allows it to uh, extend a reliable communication even into the most difficult conditions. Some features of the Mesh Rider radio include high throughput. Its uh, max data throughput is up to 100 megabits per second, so you can comfortably, easily stream uh, 4K video, HD video. That allows for low latency video streaming, uh, voice over for mission critical pu uh, push to talk, positional data on a map, and photos, um, sending photos across. Long range. The HD video streaming from ground to ground level, from person to person, we get over a mile. Uh, we actually at Doodle Labs cut our teeth on drone communications, and so when you have a drone in the sky, you can really extend that to tens of kilometers. Uh, and so you can also use a drone in the sky as a, a range extension feature where it's a repeater node in the sky. We also have integrated with apps on your phone. Really, it's in service of using your phone for, for whatever you want. Like we have TAC, there's also uh, an app called Zello, which is a cloud-based solution for mission-critical push-to-talk and more. We have TAC or any other situational awareness tool that you want to use on your phone. With the high bandwidth available, you can take full advantage of the app and what it means in a response situation and benefit from what it means. All of our radios are mesh radios. And so with a dynamic, uh, self-forming, self-healing, peer-to-peer mesh, it allows for the, the network to really work around the challenges that you might face in the field. Whether it's obstructions or obstacles, uh, by having every node talk to each other and being able to reroute that messaging, you are able to have a really dynamic deployment of your, of your network. All of these radios come with a Wi-Fi hotspot. So we've thought a lot about how can people use their devices in the field, and we know that cables can be really uh, difficult in the field. And so the Wi-Fi hotspot enables the use of a phone uh, wirelessly, but we also do have a USB-C tether that you can connect directly to the, to the device. For power, we, we have this attachable battery pack. With it, you get about eight hours of operation, and it's easily swappable. So you can have a, a gang of batteries, and you can just swap it in the field or you can power it directly with the USB PD from a tablet or a continuous power while plugged in. We have developed this capability as we worked with uh, this defense application for, for the Blue UAS program, a drone program, but we developed multi-band capability where we house multiple frequency bands in a single radio. What this does is provides an, a tactical advantage in the field so that you can scan or avoid interference, um, in-band interference, and you can operate in an altogether better frequency band. So on the commercial side, we have 900 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz together. If you're getting a lot of like Wi-Fi noise, you can operate in the 900 megahertz. Our radios are available in both unlicensed and federal frequency bands. When encryption is important, we have encryption that levels all the way up to FIPS 140-3 level one for defense applications. For more regular commercial applications, we have both um, 128 and 256-bit AES encryption. LT extension is something that we're very excited about and we think has a lot of relevance to this audience. Um, again, a firefighter going into the field, I think they actually don't really care what their networking solution is. They just want to be able to use their device in the field. And when they're in cell coverage, they'll use that. When they're off cell coverage, they'll continue with that. And that's really where, what we designed this around. Is that that's what we mean by that continuity of operation. Here's a, a bit of a, an example of it. So what we're kind of depicting here is the blue cone of coverage is LTE, the orange cone of coverage is um, satellite. And it's just to say that you have people positioned at different places. It's a really wild, uh, meant to depict a really large area of wildfire. And you have a complete dis uh, disconnected group of um, uh, groups underneath. And when they connect across a man A using the Mesh Rider network, whether there's some, if there's someone is in the satellite coverage, if someone is in LTE coverage, they effectively all are continuing to be connected by that. Those LTE and satellite networks kind of extend or ride that Mesh, net, mesh Rider network um, into those disconnected uh, spaces. Something that's also to note, we, we depicted a drone here, again, with our awareness of it, but also to, to say that as we've worked with first responders, LTE-based drone networking can really crush the whole network coverage. 
uh, it really limits the availability to the people on the ground. And so actually having drones operating on a separate uh, mesh uh, network allows for that, that video feed to come down from them and then pass across the network without impacting the overall network. So we've also uh, partnered very closely with the Amazon Web Services Disaster Response Team. They're working on something that they're calling the bubbles of connectivity for disaster response and, um, and international response efforts. In this idea, what they're trying to do is actually develop um, they are use a model that has a roving vehicle with one of our radios mounted to it, as well as uh, a long range uh, connectivity option. In this case, it's satellite. Those together then connect to uh, a dismounted team who are using the wearable mesh rider radio. Together, they're able to create a mobile ad hoc network. And as they actually fully deploy this, they're going to have a drone for every bubble of connectivity as well that then acts as an aerial access point. That should give about five kilometers of coverage for group one. And then adjacent to it, they have group two that has the same configuration. They're then able to have a little bit of overlap and they're able to create a very large area uh, mesh rider network or mobile network. We also know and work with um, spaces beyond public safety. The adoption of private mobile mesh networks extends far beyond first responders and rescue teams. Adding value in many scenarios in which teams need to maintain connectivity and share data in real time in areas where uh, existing coverage, whether it's Wi-Fi, LTE, or anything, is either weak or crowded or, uh, and, and therefore a lot of interference. So this extends into industrial sites like mines and construction sites, ports and work sites, warehousing, and healthcare facilities. At Doodle Labs, we're committed to rolling this technology out in the first responder and rescue and disaster spaces first. We see it as a priority because of the immediate impact it can have on making li uh, in saving lives and making the work of first responders safer and more effective. So in conclusion, the use of advanced mesh networking technology and situational awareness apps can make public safety teams safer and more effective uh, uh, in their efforts. And with Doodle Lab's wearable mesh rider radio, teams can maintain reliable communication in even the most difficult conditions, ultimately saving lives. We believe that this technology has the potential to revolutionize the way that public safety teams operate, and we're excited to continue to develop uh, new solutions for this important field. Thank you for listening um, and, and bearing with me. So if you're interested uh, in learning more about this specific radio or our solutions altogether for drones or other robotics, um, please come visit us. We're at booth 2366, or you can visit us at doodlelabs.com. Uh, thanks for listening.